<laughs> Sounds good. Um, thank you, Bonnie. Um, and I'm very happy to be here again. Um, I've done this, I think, last summer. Well, was it last year or two years? I'm, you know, sometimes getting confused, but uh, this is a great event. Uh, I think um, this summer immersion uh, presentations are very useful, and I'm basically hoping that all students are enjoying this. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I want to talk about, again, uh, cybersecurity, specifically on uh, wearable medical device. So basically on related to health issues. Um, myself, again, I'm professor in the EC department, um, basically associate professor. Um, my area of research um, is usually embedded systems um, and basically hardware mostly, uh, but I've been also working on um, security related topics as well. Um, I do some stuff on the circuits level, uh, but also uh, I was part of an ongoing research uh, at the Armour College, um, collaborating with uh, other professors, uh, namely Dr. Chinar at the um, Chemical Engineering Department. Uh, and that project um, is going to be main topic today. Um, that's about artificial pancreas um, and basically the security challenges on some of those devices. Um, so that that's basically going to be the main topic. Uh, if there is time left at the end, I want to also talk about some of the um, you know the degree programs we offer at the Armour College, um, specifically in our department targeting uh, these cybersecurity um, you know, fields. Uh, so if anyone is interested in uh, some of those topics, um, you may find something uh, that will suit you. Uh, so again, I will spend maybe a couple of minutes at the end of the presentation. So um, let me start um, again. Um, I think I have too many slides, so I may go fast on some of those, but I wanna start with um, basically um, the internet, internet of things. Um, now you hear this, of course, a lot, um, last couple of years, and it's get, getting even more popular. Um, so basically, everything in our household, you know, um, in our, our cars, everything are uh, basically um, using devices um, that are Internet of Things, co connected to Internet of Things. Um, and the definition of it is highly interconnected network of different entities, such as tags, sensors, embedded devices, handheld device, backend servers. So it's a very broad definition, right? Um, but again, it, it, it means that it's gonna be um, in pretty much in our daily use. Um, again, you, you can think of your you know, thermostat, right? That's a very simple example, smart thermostats uh, in your house that controls temperature. Maybe it knows that you, you arrive in your garage with your car and then it can basically start the AC, right? Um, that, that's basically very um, you know, typical example. Um, you may have a fridge, a uh, refrigerator that, that could be connected to the internet um, and you can have some information about it. Um, same thing with the cars. So it's pretty much everywhere. Um, and of course, the fact that it's so prevalent and it's so widely used uh, means that there is, of course, uh, vulnerabilities as well. And that, that's um, a major headache um, on many, many different fields, um, including, again, uh, our just uh, daily use devices, uh, but also maybe more critical devices, such as um, devices we use for healthcare, okay? Um, and again, that, that's going to be the main uh, topic uh, that we will be talking about. Um, and again, cybersecurity threats um, for these uh, IoT devices um, is going to be extremely important uh, area that um, needs to be uh, dealt with. Um, again, specifically, we will be talking about the medical devices. Um, again, um, I'm not talking about uh, energy stuff like uh, smart grid or anything. That's completely different uh, area, which is also very important. But today, I'll just talk about the um, medical device. Um, this is very important because there is a direct risk to the um, basically um, a, you know a person or a patient's um, basically uh, live being um, so again you can literally uh, harm or kill a person um, with a cyber security attack um, that's why it's extremely important to have some kind of again measures um, uh, in, into these uh, medical devices um, it, it's basically labeled as a high risk um, you know um, factor device now again if you go back 10 years ago, uh, this was pretty much uh, unrestricted. Uh, there was not much uh, regulations coming from either, again, the um, government or local, uh, you know, governments or federal governments. Uh, but that that that's uh, has changed and changing uh, very rapidly. Um, FDA is involved, 
um, they have a specific web page um, and guidance uh, for again um, medical device manufacturers uh, again in healthcare um, and you can check these links um, they have very specific uh, again uh, you know advices warnings as well and I'll show you some examples as well and they have uh, guidance um, as well so in terms of uh, a company coming up with a new device they have to follow these guidances. Otherwise, they will not be approved for use. Um, so FDA will not approve those devices. But again, um, these are all very recent, um, again, developments. So again, if you go 10 years ago, um, this did not exist. Uh, and of course, um, that was a major issue. Um, and again, we, we are still seeing some of the outcomes from uh, that unregulated um, you know, issues with respect to cybersecurity. Um, Again, there's lots of information on the FDA website, but I, again, I wanna mention two things here. Uh, one, they have a criteria for the devices um, and they go very, very simple uh, criteria. So they have two tiers. Tier one is a device that's labeled as a higher cybersecurity risk. And tier two would be a standard um, cybersecurity risk. Um, so tier one is basically think of anything that um, can connect to internet, connect to other network devices, et cetera. And, which is very important, and this device um, basically may result in harm to the patient. So if there's a, you know, some kind of attack, some kind of vulnerability, um, the operation of the uh, device is affected and it may result in uh, hurting or harming that patient. So what are those devices? Uh, think of anything such as uh, pacemakers, uh, defibrillators, insulin pumps, infusion pumps, all of these have a direct uh, impact on the patient, right? Uh, so if there's something wrong with it, some uh, interference, um, then you can literally hurt that person. So that would be tier one. Tier two is standard risk. Um, so that means uh, any device that's not categorized as tier one, which means think of, um, I would say maybe a heart rate monitor, right? Uh, it's a medical device, it measures your heart rate, but it is not an actuator. So it doesn't actually do anything uh, to the patient, right? So that may not be a tier one, right? It could be a tier uh, two device. Uh, so the reason these categories exist is that FDA has different requirements. So for a company building a device that's gonna be category uh, or tier one, it's gonna go under much more scrutiny. So that it's gonna be reviewed at a different level um, and they have to basically uh, show evidence that there's enough uh, security on those devices. And I'll give you a little bit of information on, on those. But again, um, these are the uh, again new uh, regulations coming uh, from FDA. Now, a couple of examples. Again, if you go to FDA website, um, there are some really interesting uh, cases or warnings uh, that they actually update uh, very frequently. So you may uh, see more examples uh, posted. Um, I, I want to highlight three of them. So the first one um, is basically a vulnerability on the infusion pump. So basically you go to the hospital, uh, you're on the bed, uh, and the patient is getting uh, medicine through these infusion pumps, right? Um, and these are quite smart devices, electronic devices that are uh, again, controlling the level of the dose um, and how much the patient is going to get um, and what kind of drug it's going to get. Um, and these are usually done through some kind of digital library. Uh, so the, the nurse may choose a certain drug um, and the, the device knows how much it's going to be um, basically infused, etc. Now, the problem with this device was um, it was detected that the hackers may have actually access to the library, the drug library, and change, again, the amount um, the level of the dose, et cetera. Um, and of course, that's very serious. Um, and again, it may certainly harm the patient, right? Um, and again, I highlight this because I know my wife worked at Hospira, this company, uh, and it was a major issue for the company uh, because um, they had to change their um, you know, security aspect. And also they have to uh, go and get um, you know, all the existing devices updated uh, and in, in basically insert the new protection mechanism. So it's a major issue. Uh, if you don't do it during the development, uh, changing it after the fact uh, is very difficult for the companies. Um, now, here's another example. Um, this is regarding cardiac devices. I think this is a defibrillator from Medtronic. Um, again, many issues that can uh, come out of this vulnerability, but I wanna say, uh, let me just 
use my pointer here. Um, just look at this one. So the major issue here is the problem that Medtronic has been using a, again, a wireless protocol um, and it was their own proprietary protocol, which basically had um, no protection, no encryption. Uh, you can see it, no, do not use encryption, authentication or authorization. So basically it says anybody who is listening to this communication, if they're in the correct frequency channel, they can basically get the data and in fact, um, they can hijack this and um, perhaps they can also manipulate that data as well. Um, and this is, again, your heart. You're talking about the cardiac devices. Um, again, this is very, very serious um, issue in, in terms of um, the vulnerability. Um, another example, um, this is very closely related to, um, you know, the example, the case study that I, I will talk today. Um, this is regarding diabetes uh, and insulin pumps. Um, so this insulin pump, uh, again, um, from Medtronic, uh, it's basically the pump that injects insulin for uh, patients with diabetes. Um, and again, there is a security vulnerability here. Um, and basically, um, you know, it, it says that the attackers or the hackers can change the pump settings um, and basically they can adjust the insulin level. It can basically give um, too much and actually giving too much insulin um, you can literally kill that uh, patient, um, you know, um, and also they can stop um, and maybe long-term harm can be also, um, you know, uh, be seen on the patient. Now, another thing I want to highlight here is the, the last paragraph. So it says that Medtronic cannot update this pump uh, to address these potential, potential cybersecurity risks. So as a result, FDA recommends basically to replace these pumps, right? So, I mean, you're seeing here the difficulty that um, what happens if the company is not designing it for cybersecurity, basically it's very difficult to fix it. Um, and sometimes you cannot fix it. That means that particular product has to be completely removed from the market. Uh, and basically the company has to release something new or the patient has to go get it from some other brand, right? Uh, so again, it, it is very serious, um, but at the end of the day, I also have to say that this is uh, this wasn't the case um, five, 10 years ago. So the companies, they were not regulated and they were not you know, designing for cybersecurity um, because there was no regulation. Um, that has changed. So now any such device has to be reviewed by FDA and approved. Um, and of course, if something is found in the market, then the company is in trouble because again, as you see, FDA is now for this particular pump, uh, it's basically recommending to be replaced, um, maybe with some other brand, right? Uh, so again, there are major consequences on, on, on cyber security uh, for existing devices and also for uh, developing new devices. Uh, that's a, a major uh, concern that needs to be at this. Um, a couple of things I wanna bring in, in general sense for uh, medical devices. Um, and again, we'll talk specifically about a case study um, for, again, artificial pancreas, but this is more generic, so it could be applied to any medical device. So we want, of course, device to be secure, okay? So we want the device to be, um, again, uh, have measures against any vulnerabilities. Uh, it should be able to deal with uh, multiple threats. Um, and it should be able to function even if some components are down. So there should be different service levels, and I'll give you examples on those later. Uh, but this, again, the device needs to be designed according to this, okay? So there should be mechanisms to deal with some of the uh, issues. Um, safety, um, so basically any action taken by um, medical device or let's say artificial pancreas uh, should not endanger the patient, okay? So let's say if there is a disconnection, um, you know, with some of the devices, some of the sensors, there should be a safety mechanism where the, the whole overall system should still work um, and maintain some of the uh, service level so that the patient can uh, continue their lives, okay? Um, so again, there needs to be some response alarm system and some necessary warnings or emergency uh, uh, levels. Uh, the third one uh, is usability. Um, so um, again, the devices are intended for everyday life, right? Um, and the patients could be elderly, sometimes even you know a child, right? Um, so it needs to be very simple uh, in terms of usage. 
Um, and you don't want to, again, uh, raise the complexity of usage uh, because of security uh, aspects. So you don't want to put a bunch of passwords that the user has to remember all the time and ask those passwords all the time. So those are basically bad designs in terms of usability, right? Um, so we have to balance all of these uh, issues, security, robustness, um, safety, um, and usability, all of them have to be a factor in, in the design. And again, this cannot be this cannot be added later on. It has to be part of your initial design um, aspect. All right, so let's talk about the case study and that would be again, uh, diabetes um, and artificial pancreas. Um, again, this is a, again, very, very common uh, disease uh, in just US, uh, about 30 million have diabetes, um, again, about 10%. Um, and I would say about 5% of these uh, 30 million have type one diabetes, which means they have to manage this uh, daily um, with some in insulin control. Um, and again, it's a huge, enormous cost uh, for uh, you know, patient, for the government. Um, and again, it's a leading cause of death, um, unfortunately. Um, and um, it's a chronic disease. Unfortunately, there is no again, um, again, uh, fix for it, unfortunately. So you have to, uh, again, um, there's no treatment, but you can manage this. Um, and that's basically what um, we aim to do with uh, an artificial pancreas device. So what does an artificial pancreas do? Well, diabetes is basically, um, you can simply say uh, in just simplistic form is, um, it happens because your uh, pancreas doesn't work properly. It doesn't in, uh, uh, basically uh, generate insulin uh, in, in the body, right? Um, so um, what we can do is we can use, um, again, glucose monitoring device and we can use pumps. Those are available in the market and the patient can monitor, um, you know, uh, manually their glucose level. And if there is need, they can inject insulin using the pump. Um, and you can see the pump here um, and glucose monitoring device here. Um, if you don't have these devices, you can do, again, uh, you can uh, basically, uh, you know, uh, you can look at your um, finger tip uh, uh, and you can use the pin, you can measure it manually. And again, if there's need, you can uh, inject the insulin, um, you, you know, by an injector. Uh, now, again, this is something the patient has to do manually. Now, what is an alternative? The alternative is that you have a system called artificial pancreas, which does everything for the patient. So it does the monitoring. So you have a glucose um, monitoring, continuous glucose monitoring system. You have a pump that's available. And all of this is controlled by a device. We call it a control algorithm that determines, uh, based on the sensor readings, um, does the patient need insulin? Um, and how much does it need? And then it will basically um, basically send a command to the pump and it will basically release the uh, insulin uh, at the desired level, okay? So that would be uh, the artificial pancreas, having like, sensors, control algorithms, uh, and actuators. Um, now, something I'm gonna talk later is that the control algorithm doesn't just need the glucose monitoring uh, sensor, but it needs some additional stuff. So you need to know if the patient is doing exercise, is the patient sleeping, uh, what is the heart rate, what is the energy expenditure, what is the galvanic skin response. So there's a bunch of other signals, uh, vital signals that needs to be um, coming into the system. And then you, if the system or the artificial pancreas will make a fair judgment in terms of um, what to do next, or what would be the insulin level, uh, does it, uh, does the patient need any additional insulin, et cetera. All of them will be done in real time. And the bottom line is, if you have that kind of system in place, the patient is basically is not doing anything. Uh, it, basically, the patient will continue his or her life, um, you know, without actually thinking about uh, again, uh, maybe other than changing the cartridge for the insulin pump. Uh, that's going to be it, uh, and that that's obviously uh, extremely good um, target. Now, a couple of things here. With the uh, diabetes patients, there are two issues that need to be solved. One is the hyperglycemia, which means that your glucose levels in the blood sugar is extremely low, um, and that's an immediate danger. So it may actually uh, result in patient um, basic fainting and also even uh, death. 
the hyperglycemia, that's the long term. So basically you have very high glucose levels, blood sugar level is high. Uh, and again, that in the long term, of course, as nerve damage, uh, hypertension, and eventually uh, amputation as well. So you wanna prevent both of these, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. So you have to balance the blood glucose level um, between, again, the levels that will not cause either of those, right? Um, again, I'm gonna skip, there's a little bit more detail on it, but again, the idea is that, again, you wanna maintain a normal glucose level, uh, less than the maximum and more than the minimum level. Um, and that can be done through, again, insulin, uh, that helps glucose level decrease um, if you have a high glucose, a high blood uh, sugar level. If you have a low blood sugar level, then you need glucagon, um, and you can basically address this uh, by maybe eating something uh, with carbohydrates. Uh, maybe you drink an orange juice uh, so that you can increase your, um, again, glucose level, okay? So the artificial pancreas is supposed to do this, um, this balancing act between, again, the glucose uh, low level and high level glucose level um, using pumps and, again, a bunch of sensors, okay? Now, Again, there are some levels that you have to maintain, et cetera, uh, 50 milligram uh, to 250, those are the expected levels. Now, a um, couple of things I wanna add before we go to the case study. Um, in, in terms of, again, the glucose response, uh, in addition to, again, the insulin, um, there are other factors like exercise. Uh, if someone is doing exercise, um, that's gonna actually reduce the glucose uh, concentration. So. Um, at that point, maybe if you, if you know that the patient is going to do exercise, or if you detect that somebody is doing exercise, then you don't want to give insulin, right? Um, because um, that's going to uh, um, increase the impact. Same thing with the sleep. Uh, on the other hand, uh, increasing glucose concentration, uh, obviously eating uh, your meal uh, and stress levels, those are also going to increase um, the glucose concentration. So the reason we put them here is that when you design an artificial pancreas system, you will need sensors to take care of all of these, right? So you need to know if there's an exercise going on, if this patient is sleeping, if there's actually uh, eating, or if there's a high level of stress uh, on that patient, right? So all of this needs to be detected by uh, the artificial pancreas system. So it's not just glucose level. You need additional sensors, additional uh, physiological signals coming in to the system, okay? Um, and again, that, that's gonna be uh, the target goal for the AP system, okay? Um, so let me go down next uh, and talk about, again, what is being done uh, in terms of developing this AP system, uh, artificial pancreas system. And as Bonnie said, most of our research uh, at IIT, of course, it's um, multidisciplinary collaboration. Uh, and this is another good example. And um, again, um, this uh, artificial pancreas system, is being developed at, again, um, CHPE department uh, for many years now by the group uh, under Dr. Chenard. Um, certainly, I think it goes almost 10 years now. Uh, and they've been very successful. A lot of grants from uh, NIH coming in. Um, and, and again, they, they literally have working uh, AP system now. Um, now, in terms of um, this system, um, again, it's similar to what I discussed so far. Um, basically, there is a controller uh, which could be a smartphone or maybe a laptop. Um, there's a pump, um, there's a continuous glucose uh, rating system. And then there's a bunch of sensors. It could be an armband, or it could be like a watch, uh, but there's gonna be multiple sensors and you will perform a sensor fusion. Uh, and that means you will get accelerometer data, gamma skin response, energy expenditure, heart rate, glucose level. All of this will be an input to the control algorithm and the control algorithm will decide in real time without the user interference, um, basically how much insulin is necessary. And perhaps if the uh, blood glucose levels are very low, it will maybe trigger an alarm um, and basically will alert the user to maybe have a snack, okay? Uh, and this is all automated. There's absolutely no input um, necessary from the patient, okay? Um, so that is the goal of this system, and that is what needs to be done as an AP system, okay? Um, again, components, um, smartphone um, that the patient is using, that smartphone controls all the, again, sensors um, and also the actuators. 
Um, most of the time, this will be through Bluetooth um, and also through internet. Uh, maybe it's connected to the server. So there's a database. All the patient data um, is actually um, uh, stored and monitored um, on both locally on the smartphone and perhaps on the server. The algorithm in initially uh, it was running on a computer, a laptop that's connected to the smartphone. Um, but uh, again, there's already work that's been done so that you can actually bypass this uh, and run everything on the smartphone as well. So either one is uh, perfectly possible. Um, and again, just looking at this, um, you can see that this actually is a pretty complex system because you're now dealing with the control algorithm, which is very complex. Um, it uses real-time physiological signals, vital signals, um, and it also requires some past uh, data from the patient. Uh, so you need some database and it needs to interact with, you know, multiple devices, uh, reading data, sensor data, and also controlling maybe the pump, issuing the commands, et cetera, right? Now, the reason I highlight this is that this is a very difficult scenario for um, cybersecurity, right? Because you're now looking at a multifaceted system where things may go wrong at any of these nodes. It like, couldn't go wrong on any of the sensors, actuators, uh, on the smartphone, on the server, on the computer, and it may go wrong on the communication channels as well. Uh, so you're not talking about the devices, but you're talking about maybe the, uh, the communication channels uh, and many in the middle attacks, right? So it's a very complicated, uh, very difficult and complicated scenario in terms of preventing any uh, cyber attacks, okay? Um, so let's look at, again, some of the operations. Um, so we have, again, the mobile AP system. There are sensors and actuators. Most likely these are connected through Bluetooth, maybe low energy protocol. Um, there is a control algorithm uh, in either smartphone or on a computer that is also connected to the internet, um, maybe to the server. So you have database interface as well. So maybe, you know, the, the hospital is able to monitor the patient's data, right, in real time uh, because it's connected to the server. So that's possible. Um, and you want to achieve a reliable platform. So you want to achieve reliable communications. You want to establish continuous service, uninterrupted service. And there has to be some alarm module where if something goes wrong, you alert the patient. And also maybe you alert not just the patient, but maybe the, the service provider, the hospital, right? And in terms of secure platform, again, you have to consider data security, basically where you store the data, how it's stored, the physical protection of the devices, and not just the smartphone, but all the sensors, uh, all the actuators. Um, there has to be some kind of user authentication. So not any person who gets the, you know, let's say smartphone can access the data. Uh, and also there has to be a data flow enforcement. So um, we should be, um, maintaining a certain data flow uh, so we can prevent any illegal activities um, and we have to detect any intrusion. So those are the objectives uh, in terms of what we want to achieve on this particular case studies. Uh, in this case, it's the artificial pancreas. But I would say uh, this is typical for any medical device related uh, system. Um, think about um, again, maybe um, again, you're in the hospital, there is a infusion pump connected to you. So all the stuff that I'm talking about here also applies to those devices as well, okay? Um, there could be some changes in uh, the sensors, et cetera, but the overall objectives are pretty much identical, okay? Uh, again, overall view here, again, you have the controller, the, your smartphone, uh, it connects to the insulin pump, but also it gets readings from sensors, glucose sensors, uh, activity sensors coming in, and the controller makes a decision whether to change the infusion dose that connects to the insulin pump, it releases the insulin to the you know, patient, or maybe it detects a, um, an alarm level, which means low glucose level in the uh, blood, so means that the patient actually needs to uh, eat uh, something sweet, so carbohydrates, uh, so basically it gives a warning uh, basically, it could be um, maybe message on the smartphone, um, and it could be actually even even sent to the hospital, so the, the doctor may even call that patient, right? Um, and then this is again continuous loop, so this is going to be working 24/7 um, and without interruption. Okay, 
Now, specific components, uh, again, some of these may change, but at, at least uh, in, at some level, th these were the devices that we were look, looking at. So we were using a tandem uh, pump, T uh, slim. Uh, so that uh, basically pump uh, is able to have a bezel rate, uh, which is uh, default. And then you can change the bolus uh, level uh, depending on the readings. Uh, there's a continuous glucose monitoring device from Dexcom G5. Um, and there is a activity tracker uh, and pet the cup. This is a wristwatch. Um, and again, it gives a bunch of different sensor readings, accelerometer, blood volume pulse, heart rate, galvanic skin response. All of these are part of the, uh, this uh, wristwatch. Uh, and now you have a smartphone uh, running Android that can take care of all of this um, you know, uh, sensor fusion, okay? Now, this is important because when you look at this, uh, you know, bunch of different devices, and these are off-the-shelf devices. These are not developed for a particular purpose uh, of AP. Uh, these are simply, um, you know, uh, individual uh, off-the-shelf devices. And that is a problem because each one has um, maybe a different security implementation, different sampling rate. So the data that's coming from GC, uh, CGM is five minutes, but uh, the wristband maybe 30 times per second, uh, depending on the data. Um, so again, everything is different based on the device. So you don't have one uh, solution for each device. There will be different, uh, again, commands, different um, uh, monitoring for each of these devices. And that's a challenge, right? Um, in terms of, again, the high level, uh, what needs to be done and what we have done on this um, artificial pancreas system, we basically developed an app uh, running on the Android. Um, and the key services that are de defined in this uh, AP is, uh, again, you have, again, these controller um, thread on Dexcom, which is, again, the um, glucose monitoring thread, uh, and Pethica, uh, that's basically the activity monitoring, uh, and Tandem, it's a different service uh, thread uh, for, again, the pump. Um, and you can see here at the bottom, CGM, Data is coming every five minutes. Um, you know, blood volume uh, basically it's six to four times per second. Accelerometer is 32. Uh, galvanic skin response is four. So every sensor is sending data at different levels. And what happens is that they go into a database. This is a local database on, on the smartphone. And then the controller basically in real time continuously monitors the data coming in and makes decisions um, to either uh, go to the tandem service for the pump and change the uh, basal rate or basically inject new bolus, uh, insulin bolus, or if it's low level glucose, maybe it's gonna send an alarm um, and basically instruct the user to eat uh, some, something sweet, right? So that's the high level look in terms of uh, the services that needs to be done in the, uh, the app developed on the Android and the data flow. So basically uh, this needs to be uh, preserved uh, during the uh, operation. Now let's talk a little bit more specific about the cybersecurity aspect. Um, as I said, lots of new regulations are uh, being introduced. Um, and in, in terms of medical device, there are standards now coming from IEEE, et cetera, um, just like what FDA is uh, also going through their guidelines. Uh, now, specifically for diabetes, there is also um, a society called Diabetes Technology Society. And starting around uh, at the end of 2017, they introduced uh, a standard uh, specifically for dealing with the uh, diabetes device security. And that would include all the glucose um, monitoring devices, the pumps, and also the obviously the artificial pancreas devices that may come to the market. Um, and this standard has been going through some revisions. Um, it, they do have some final version, uh, but they are still working on it. Now, we look at this uh, when we were designing this AP system, um, and there are some mandatory objectives. So that do, these are mandatory requirements that the, uh, this society is um, basically requiring for any device that deals with diabetes. Uh, what are those? Those are protected communications, right? So basically explicitly secure user authorization um, for the remote monitoring device, control device. Um, and again, basically that means you need to have some kind of username password uh, authentication if you're using that, let's say smartphone, or if you're using a glucose monitoring device. 
Now, we have to also ensure that the device, is, uh, device integrity is ensured. So it's not uh, basically vulnerable. And the third one is uh, cryptographic objectives. So basically, um, there needs to be at least a um, you know, um, minimum cryptography encryption in some of the um, parts of the algorithm. Now, you may say this is so trivial. I mean, it sounds so simple, right? Uh, I agree, but remember, uh, I've shown you some case studies at the start of the um, talk, and there was a pump without any any user uh, authentication or any encryption at all. So literally, the companies were able to develop and release those devices in the market before regulations come into place. That's why, although this objective sounds very simple and trivial, um, it is necessary because again, if this is not part of the uh, mandatory objective, then the company may release something without that encryption. Now, why would a company not include encryption? Well, think about maybe power consumption. These are portable devices. You need, um, you know, lots of maybe, um, you know, very limited battery, right? Uh, battery and lifetime of that device. Um, so if you include encryption, usually that means more computation uh, and that means a more power usage. So basically the battery, uh, you know, usage is going to increase. So again, uh, that's a concern for the company. So they may not optional, if it's optional, they may not include that encryption, right? Um, so again, these are the three uh, mandatory objectives. They also uh, include some optional objectives um, and some of the authentication um, and physical protection of the ports um, and also maybe environmental security, right? How do you prevent um, against maybe um, loss or theft of the device, uh, or in, in maybe what happens when you lose that device? Do you have your data uh, open in, in the environment, or do you have your data securely uh, encrypted in that device so the the, the 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 one the thief will not have access to it? Right. So those are the additional concerns that needs to be uh, dealt with. Now, I want to also highlight a few things in terms of what can happen if some again hacker gets access to this. Um, let's say AP system, artificial pancreas, okay? Now, there is a certainly chance that um, they can basically cause insulin overdose and hyperglycemia. How? By having a large basal rate or large bolus injection. And that can be due to, again, the hacker hijacking the pump, tampering the sensor values, or corrupting the control algorithm. So if you are not careful with the system, if the, uh, the control algorithm is um, not, again, um, secured, uh, maybe somebody changed um, a few lines in the algorithm and basically uh, it works wrong and basically results in large bolus. And again, that would be insulin overdose, right? Now, uh, insulin suspend will result in hyperglycemia. Uh, basically pump is, um, again, suspended. That could be because of several reasons, pump disconnection, again, tampering with the sensors or corrupting the control algorithm, right? So the hackers can do any of these and the result will be, again, um, hyperglycemia. Now, delayed treatment, uh, hypo or hyperglycemia, again, um, several reasons, pump disconnection, um, hijack. You can do you know, some tricky stuff, like you can um, overload the CPU running on that control algorithm so that it's going to be delayed in the response. The latency is going to increase, right? Uh, and that will result in long processing time. So the, the control algorithm will not be able to react in time. And that's certainly possible. Um, sensor disconnects, right? So if you're not getting glucose um, readings, to whatever reason, maybe the hacker um, bypassed it or blocked the sensor, that may result in it. Um, and fourth uh, hazard will be data leakage. So basically uh, some third party, uh, unauthorized third party may have access to all the patient data, right? Um, and that, that's certainly a very important issue. Um, somebody may have access to your medical data, either at the local database on your smartphone or at the, at the remote server. Uh, so that, that's gonna be um, another major issue. Um, and of course, this is very common. I mean, we keep hearing it. You know, all major companies losing their uh, again uh, data um, is basically scrutinized, and the same thing may happen for medical data as well. So all of this is uh, that needs to be addressed um, in in the AP artificial pancreas system. So we have to find a way to prevent all of these 
possible hazards, right? Um, so again, it's a very, very complicated scenario. Um, and again, I think I've shown this before, but you have vulnerability at the devices. So the, maybe the laptop running the control algorithm or the smartphone, the server, the sensors, the pump, um, and also the, the communication links. Now, in our example, that communication link mostly is Bluetooth from sensors to the smartphone, um, internet uh, to the server, and perhaps either Wi-Fi or a USB, physical USB connection from smartphone to the algorithm laptop. So when you're designing the system to be secure, um, you have to make sure all these channels, all these communication links to be secure. It's not just the Bluetooth, you have to think about the internet connection, you have to think about uh, maybe the USB connection. Um, so it's not just one media, one medium, uh, you have to consider all of this, right? Um, again, I think I'm gonna skip this one, we talk about this. Um, in, in terms of the sensor readings, again, there could be forged or fake sensor reading, even worse, fake comments. So maybe the pump receives a, again, forged command to inject more insulin, um, not because of the control algorithm, but because, again, a third party hacker is actually uh, asking for it. Uh, and that's a major issue that's gonna hurt or harm that patient. Um, again, same thing with the laptop um, and also the, the server um, communications as well. Um, again, from phone uh, or the smartphone perspective, Again, you, you have to think about local devices um, in terms of the sensors, actuator, um, and you also have to think about, um, again, the internet connection uh, where you have a bigger database. Uh, maybe that database actually holds not just one patient, but all the patients um, that, that's gonna be in, in that system and maybe connected to the hospital, right? A um, Couple of very specific examples in, in terms of communication with the peripheral device. Uh, in our case, for the AP, uh, these devices are mostly using Bluetooth. Um, so the glucose monitoring device, the activity tracker, the wristwatch, uh, the pump, they are using Bluetooth. Um, and the versions that we use, uh, they are specifically using Bluetooth uh, LE uh, protocol, low energy. Um, but even in that, uh, there are options for manufacturers. They can use different levels, and I, I can uh, highlight it here, level one through level four, right? So if a manufacturer uses level one, that means basically there's no security on, on that device. Now, another one may use level four. That means both pairing and the data will be encrypted. Uh, and that's what we want to see, right, um, in terms of uh, the security. But these are off-the-shelf devices. So if you choose something without I guess, checking the uh, security level, you may end up with a device that's basically was not providing security. Although it's a Bluetooth low energy, um, it's simply the manufacturer didn't enable uh, the security level. So that's a problem. Um, and again, it was quite common to see these uh, unprotected devices in the market. But now again, uh, things are a little bit better because of um, regulations. Um, in, in terms of communication between, uh, let's say a computer laptop to the smartphone, um, we basically uh, uh, established a symmetric encryption. Um, so we're using RSA, uh, so you have a public key, um, and then we use a private key to sign all these messages requesting um, the, the data and basically data transfer from smartphone. These are signed by private keys um, and doing symmetric uh, encryption. And, and what, the, what this does is it prevents a man in the middle attack. So if somebody is in, in the middle, uh, and trying to, again, get the data or even send data to the smartphone, uh, basically what's gonna happen is that because the, the person here doesn't have the private key, um, it will not be able to sign the request uh, and it will not be able to get that data back uh, because it's, gonna, it's not gonna respond, okay? So it's a very simple system, but even these simple mechanisms are very effective. Um, some of those uh, vulnerabilities can be prevented by uh, going through some of those um, implementations. In terms of communication with the server, we basically use a secure sockets layer, SSL. So any transaction between, um, again, the smartphone to the remote server is gonna go, go through the SSL. Um, so the data is gonna be um, encrypted. Uh, so if someone is again listening, uh, they will not be again able to decrypt that uh, particular data. 
Um, in terms of the storage, remember we have a local storage, a database on the smartphone. Um, and again, that's a concern because if someone has access to the smartphone later and somehow maybe um, have a password to unlock the phone, uh, you want that data to be secure as well. So basically we are using, um, a, again, uh, encrypted database, SQL Lite. Um, so basically uh, using Cypher um, and basically the data is stored as encrypted. Um, so you can see that um, the data comes here, heart rate 87, accelerometer, x axis, timestamp, and that goes as encrypted to the data uh, base. And this is the local one. Obviously you need also data transmitted to the remote side. Um, and that also has a, again, uh, encrypted MySQL implementation. So that also is uh, secured. And also there's authentication uh, requirements uh, on the secure uh, server as well. So these are some of the simple things that can be done in terms of um, you know, eliminating some of the well-known vulnerabilities, right? But more importantly, um, you will need some kind of safety um, and security module and, and monitoring sys, um, service. Uh, and what that means is that on the app running on this smartphone, uh, you will be continuously monitoring the status uh, on all these services, the activity service, um, greeting the glucose monitoring, and also the pump and the controller. So all of this will be monitored by this uh, service. Uh, it's a, again, a thread running on that app, right? And why is this important? Because this service uh, is in charge of different service levels and also generating the alarms. What do I mean by service level? So let's say you have service level one, which means full connectivity. Everything is working as expected. All devices, sensors, um, you know, actuators, and your control algorithm, everything's fine. Uh, you may actually have a service level two. Why? Maybe you lost internet. And that may happen, right? So maybe the smartphone is not able to send data to uh, outside world. Um, and again, the system will work, but there won't be any remote alarms. So you will not be able to get in touch with maybe your hospital um, and maybe the hospital will not be able to do remote monitoring, okay? Um, now things may go even worse. You may go to the service level three, perhaps no pump connection, okay? So you, you lose connection, Bluetooth connection to your pump. Um, so you have to be able to manage this as well. So that means maybe the pump is only doing basal rates. So there's a minimum amount of uh, insulin provided, but you will not be able to do the bolus, right? Um, in, that no, uh, in that case, the system at the service level three should indicate a manual mode. So the phone, your smartphone, should give a local alert to the patient saying that, okay, the AP is not working because the connection to pump is gone. Do manual injection, manual uh, insulin injections, right? Uh, and maybe the pump has a manual input mode. So the, the, the user, the patient can be alerted for that. Um, service level four, maybe you lose the pump, you lose the internet, and maybe you lose the activity tracker as well, right? Um, so there, there is still a remedy for it. Uh, a, you know, a, although it's not going to be very effective, the algorithm can still do some prediction. Um, again, as long as there is no exercise or sleep mode, right? So if someone, a patient, is not doing exercise, the AP control algorithm is still going to be working okay, um, but it won't detect the exercise uh, automatically, right? So the, there's going to be an alert going to the system saying exercise. Um, what about service level five? Well, that's the worst case. So you lose everything. CGM is gone, pump is gone, no activity. So at that point, of course, um, the, 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 the system has to go into complete manual mode. There's gonna be alarms, uh, alerts going to the user um, and basically the measurement uh, has to be done manually, finger stick, et cetera, uh, and the user will be alerted. Um, and there are some safety alarms here. Um, so you can see the red one here, NRU, non-responsive user. So basically you try to, again, activate messages, you know, sound alarms on the phone and see if the user responds. Uh, if the user does, does not respond, then you go to a state which is called non-responsive uh, user in danger. Um, and that means, again, there, there has to be additional alarms. Uh, maybe, again, if there's internet, you connect to the hospital, 
call 911, all of this could be part of this. Now, the reason I talk about this um, service and alarm levels, these are integrated with um, all the cybersecurity countermeasures. So if, again, the attack is maybe disabling internet or disabling connection to the pump, right? Then the system here has some kind of service level that can still address those attacks, right? So again, you, you may not be able to prevent it, but if the attack is successful and there's some disconnection, you, your system is still gonna be able to work uh, with some additional limitations. Uh, but these are the additional service and alarm levels that needs to be in the system um, so that even in the case of an attack, um, the system can function uh, properly, okay? Um, again, I'm gonna skip some of these. These are uh, pretty much talking about, again, possible alarm levels um, and also the system states that will um, happen. But again, overall, it's a very complex system. Um, you have to consider security, preventing any attacks, and also you have to find ways to deal with the attacks if they happen, right? Um, and there are additional concerns about usability, ease of access. So if you make the interface very difficult for user to use, uh, for elderly, for child, um, then obviously it's not desired. So uh, that's a concern. If you do very brute force encryption, very high level, then there's gonna be an issue with respect to computation and maybe battery, right, uh, battery usage. So there are many challenges uh, as a system when you're designing like this. Um, but again, uh, it has to be done. Um, and now we have regulations and uh, standards that need to be uh, uh, basically followed. Um, and that basically is what all the medical devices now uh, have to be concerned with. Um, again, it's evolving very fast. As I said, 10 years ago, almost no regulation. Things started accelerating five years ago. And now we already have some standards established, although they are being revised as well. But again, if you wanna bring a new device into the market, you have to go through all these steps uh, in terms of uh, security aspects and also safety aspects. Um, and again, we need lots of people in uh, expertise with uh, these uh, issues uh, on cybersecurity. So again, I know we have only five minutes or so left, but I just wanna briefly mention we do have degrees specializing for these devices, uh, uh, these concerns in, in the C department um, and also other departments at IIT also. I know ITM has some and computer science also has the degree programs. Specifically in our department, we have a, a Bachelor of Science in Computer and Cybersecurity Engineering. Um, I think to the best of my knowledge, we are one of the few departments uh, uh, offering engineering degree uh, at the Bachelor of Science level uh, for cybersecurity. So we really, we are one of the few in the nation uh, for engineering um, education at the Bachelor of Science. Uh, we also have a, a master's uh, degree called Master of Cybersecurity Engineering. Um, again, this is a two-year program, professional master's um, that uh, students can take. Um, and again, specializing on cybersecurity, we have a lot of courses um, designed for this program, brand new courses, again, wireless network, computer network, uh, computer cybersecurity, new courses, uh, again, um, and lots of exciting stuff going on. And a couple of things interesting about these degree programs, both at the undergrad and um, grad level is that uh, it is multidisciplinary. So we uh, have courses from other departments such as computer science, even ITM, and also law school. Um, so. Here's an example. Uh, students are actually supposed to take some of these courses um, minimum, uh, but yet they can even take more. Um, um, and so it becomes, again, more multidisciplinary um, aspect, okay? Um, again, I'm running short of time, so I'm gonna stop here. Uh, oh, one final thing. Uh, I think that's kind of interesting. We have also a dedicated student organization called CyberHawks for, again, security-related issues. They are very active, very large student group. Um, they compete every year, different uh, hackathons and other you know, events. Um, so again, if you're interested in any of these cybersecurity issues, um, get in touch with, again, Cyberhawks um, at IIT. Um, and they, they are always looking for new students coming in, okay? Um, again, I'm just gonna stop here. Um, and any questions, I'll be happy to answer.